morning. Looking forward to our study today as we get started again into the book of, uh, well, we're looking to 1 Corinthians and we're looking at the chapters of uh, 10 and 11. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and get them and we'll get started. But give me just a second here as I scramble to get some things together. All right. Well, yesterday, well, it was one of those days. I can't I can't even explain to you everything that seemed to have gone crazy. But uh, <clears throat> before we do that, let's make sure that we open with the word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your goodness and your grace to us. It extends far beyond what we could imagine. Wherever I think, you have given to us a day in which your word remains very precious. And so we ask that your spirit will guide and direct us, give us understanding, and to all that you would have for us, and we will give you thanks and give you praise as we go forward. Heavenly Father, we want to pray for those who are struggling today. Uh, we'll pray for uh, Tim McKinley's um, family, because his uncle and aunt uh, were in a terrible motorcycle accident yesterday, and uh, Tim's uncle was killed, and his aunt uh, is in critical condition, and the family is trying to rally and deal with the situation. We just uphold them to you. And who are asking for your mercy, asking for your grace. We pray for Lisa as she continues to push through the school year. Al, as he recovers from his chemo. Joyce, as the family goes through this time of difficulty of uh, battling cancer once again. We uphold them to you as we think of others as well. And ask in the name of Jesus for your divine hand, for your wisdom, for your very presence. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So grab your Bibles and let's get started here. Give me just a sec. I guess I'm, there we go. A little too bright in my face there. All right. Well, yesterday was one of those days. The internet didn't work for me when I needed it to. Things were going on. And uh, well, then I had youth yesterday. And uh, the youth is always fun. Okay. But it's always a challenge. I had everything going. I was on schedule. I texted I'll be just a few minutes late. And I burned the brownies. That's right. At 425 degrees, not a good temperature for a batch of brownies. And um, I'm thinking, why do the brownies smell? And I got another 10 minutes of baking. <laughs> yeah, oh, boy, they were baked all right. And uh, I tried to salvage them, you know, as a kind of a guy does, right? And well, maybe the insides are better than the outside. <laughs> it was destroyed. All right. So it was kind of one of those days today, but I'm looking forward as we, uh, we study today. So grab your Bibles and let's get started as we look into 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11. So we're looking at warnings from Israel's history. And Paul says, listen, there is so much that has happened in times past and things have not changed. God gives us examples from the history of Israel so that we can understand he is the same God. The same God who parted the seas is the same God that we find ourselves in today. It is Jesus Christ. It was Jesus Christ back then who brought them through, who provided water in the desert. It is Jesus Christ who made sure that they had manna. It was Jesus Christ all the way. And here it is today, Jesus Christ. Now, if Jesus Christ in the Old Testament was upset with the Jewish people and um, most of them, and they died in the wilderness because they refused to go into the promised land. What Jesus had wanted them to experience, the fruit of the land, the blessing, they refused to go in because of unbelief. Well, it is the same thing today as well. We can refuse to go in because we refuse to surrender. We have refused to give up our, our personal freedoms and love one another, free afraid to give up that there's something better. And God is saying, that's what the kingdom of God is all about. And it's here on earth today that we can enjoy the fruit of this kingdom, but we have to wait to suffer through it. And unfortunately, so lose so many opportunities in the meantime of steading going into the promised land. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about the beauty of salvation. You know, there are a lot of Christians who are just miserable. They are miserable people. Matter of fact, they're probably more miserable now as Christians than they were when they were pagans and they were doing their own thing. Now they're divided. They're divided in their own thoughts and hearts and 
not wanting to follow God, but yet knowing there was no elsewhere to go. And they are miserable creatures. And um, they have not entered the promised land. They have not entered the kingdom of God, which Jesus talked about. He says, there's warnings from, his, from Israel's history, idol feasts and the Lord's Supper. We're going to talk about that. Believer's freedom. What is it to have freedom, but yet what is it to be free in Christ? I'm covering the head in worship. What's this all about? And correcting an abuse in the, of the Lord's Supper. It had included every aspect of their life, even that which was most sacred and was to unite them together because of their selfishness, because of their unwilling to relent and repent, even that which is the Lord's Supper is abused and it becomes something that was detestable. So much of the Old Testament became that as well. What was meant for a blessing only became something that God eventually just despised because they polluted it. And instead of allowing it to change them, they changed it. Okay, so let's start here. Verse one, for I do not want you to be ignorant. Remember, in the last few days, we go, you know, you know, you know. Kept, Paul kept on pounding away. And then he would go, but we know, we know. And now he's telling them, hey, I don't want you to be ignorant. You've been puffed up in times past. Love edifies. You know this and you know this. But this I do not want you to be ignorant of. I want to draw special attention to this. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, and he's talking to them both. Here is the entire group together, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea, okay? And they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So what does this have to do? He's getting there. Hang on. They all ate the same spiritual food and they drank from the spiritual drink. What do you mean? As a body of believers, they all came and they had these experiences for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. Hold it. The spiritual rock that it, did they pick up this huge rock and they carry it from place to place that it would provide water? No, they did not. But the spiritual rock was Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul says here. He says, all of this cloud coming through the sea, all of this was Jesus Christ, the spiritual rock who followed them, united them, and yet they were not united under him. They were yet divided among him and by him. And so we see everything that they had, all the blessings that they had opportunities to experience God was just a waste. Okay, and Paul says, learn from this. You have so much even more because it's been made very evident that this rock, this manna, which, which followed them around in the wilderness was Christ Jesus. This is the culmination of the age. All of this has happened. And now we realize that it is God in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And, um, uh, so don't lose the opportunity as he's warning them. Okay. God was not pleased with most of them for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So they drank of the same spiritual drink, drink and they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied and that was Christ Jesus. Okay. And that's the end of verse four. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, even though they had these great blessings. You know, we have so much to offer. We got God's spirit, which we drink of. And we will never have to thirst again. We have the blessings of the gathering together, the gifts that God has given us. And yet all of this can be a waste and God can remain unhappy with us. Why? Because we've turned it into something that is to be a blessing for us and for others and to become an indulgence upon ourselves. All right. Now these things are, occur. Why? As an example, to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So Paul said, listen, guys, 
Let us not put our hearts on evil things. Why? Because this is, an, this is idolatry. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. So idolatry, it is sitting down to eat and drink and to get up and to indulge in revelry, celebrating their own lives and um, the carnality of what it is to be human. We should not commit sexual immorality. Why? Because that is idolatry, as some of them did. And on one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test God, Christ. Why? Because that is idolatry, as some of them did, and they were killed by snakes. And we should not grumble. Why? Because that is idolatry. We are worshiping an idol, our own selves, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angels. And so he talks about what idolatry is. It's just not an image on a pole. It's the image of ourselves and the importance, self-importance that we put upon ourselves. Why? Because knowledge will puff up. And it will give us a, a delusion that we are important and take our focus off of who is, and that is Christ in one another. These things happen, why? As an example, and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So when you talk about from the beginning and everything that has taken place, and the momentum as through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through the law, through Moses, through the prophets, all of this is building up for the culmination of the age that they now lived in and which the age we now live in. And as we look as things are starting to, to uh, slow down, meaning that time is coming to an end, but everything is starting to speed up when it comes to the birth pains. This is the culmination of the age. We are coming closer and closer. So if you think that you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. What you are experiencing, the struggles in which you are having in and of the self, of your flesh, of your desires, of your selfishness. These are all common. Nothing has ever changed but you are held more accountable. Why? Because all of history is there to teach you. And the Holy Spirit is yours to strengthen you so that you will not have to fall. And he says this, guess what? You go down this road of idolatry. You go to the bars and to the places where you're going to be tempted. I haven't given you up even there. And there is a way of escape because I would not allow you to be taken into a valley where there was no way of going out. Now, it may appear that way because just as the deliverance of uh, Israel out of the land of Egypt, they came through the narrow straits and Israel was stuck when right in front of them was the Red Sea. Right behind them, Pharaoh's army was coming down this cavern and there was no way of an escape. But God says, guess what? I would never do that to you. Have faith go forward, and he opened up the way. Even wherever we are at, in the place of our desperation, because we have created in our wandering a trap, God says, I have not left you. Trust in me, look to me, and I will be a fire that will protect you on the backside, but you must walk in faith through the open sea that I will part for you. I will not leave you without a way to escape. And you're thinking, can we climb those mountains? I don't know. <laughs> it looks a little easier than trying to escape through the, yo through the sea here. Trust God. All right. <clears throat> the key, though, is never get in those positions. All right. As we continue on here. These things were given us an example in the culmination of the age. No temptation. Verse 13 has overtaken you, except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. 
But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Notice that you can endure it. You're going to go through it. You're going to go through the temptation. You're going to go through the times of suffering. You're going to go through the testing, much of which you have occurred upon yourself, but you will endure it. Therefore, my dear friends, verse 14, flee from my idolatry. All of these things have brought you to this place of testing. Don't worry, you can endure it. But if you want to avoid it, flee from idolatry. And let me explain what that means. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. <laughs> you got any common sense here? Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? He's talking about communion. And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, who we are, for we all share of the one loaf. And now let's recall everything that has led up to this. The church is divided. It is divided not over theology, as much as it is divided over each person seeking their own freedom. I can eat meat. I know there's nothing about that meat. I don't believe in any other gods. So I'm just going to the meat part market where the food is fresh. Get me a steak. Regardless of what my brother might think that I'm worshiping other gods, I really don't care. I want a good steak. Paul says, guess what? You're living in idolatry, not because you're eating the steak, because you're worshiping yourself. You're not caring for your brethren. You're caring more about your own personal freedoms and rights. And he says, this is why the church is divided. It cares more about the freedoms that God has provided for us that we're unwilling to lay down for the sake of the brethren. When we lay down, when we die to our self-interest and we live for the interest of others, not trying to please others, but to help others, there's a huge difference. If we try to please others, we'll never satisfy them nor ourselves and life is miserable. But when we go forward to try to serve and to love others, we will always be richer for it. No matter how much we are giving, and Paul gives a lot, he said, listen, I didn't take a wife with me. Barnabas hasn't taken a wife. Don't we deserve to have the comforts and companionship of a wife as we travel along? How about pay? I mean, shouldn't we be able to minister to you instead of having to work eight, 10 hours a day making tents and everything to provide our own food and everything else so that we have the opportunity to spend more time with you? But yet we haven't chosen these things. Why? because we don't want these to be a hindrance. We've purposely laid them aside because of our love for you and the, and the sake of the gospel. And we're not complaining. Oh no, it's been a great blessing. But we tell you this so that you will understand that this is how to enter the kingdom of God, the promised land, to be able to enjoy the fruit of this land and to be richly blessed. Is your life miserable? Are you not happy? Are you living for yourself? Do you know Jesus as your savior, but not your neighbor as the one that you are to love? Oh, God has called us to live a different life. One that can be filled with abundance and is to enter into that kingdom. And that's what he's describing here. He says, you're divided, not over your theology, you're divided over your interest. You're still loving and serving yourself more than me and more than one another. Okay, and so they're still fleshly. They haven't entered the promised land as Christ described it. And he says here, but there is one loaf. We are one body, folks. We need to take care of one another. <laughs> you need to have shoes for your feet. You need to have gloves for your hand. Otherwise, your feet are going to get beat up. Your hands are going to get splintered and callous, or they're going to get 
you know, worn out. You need to take care of one another. Consider the people of Israel, verse 18. Do not, do not those who eat the sacrifice participate in the altar? He says, of course they do. Do I mean then that food sacrifice to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, absolutely not. I've already talked to you about that. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to participate with demons. And what does he mean by that? You mean if I eat the food and I'm participating with demons? No. Demons are out there to destroy people's lives. And if you are participating in destroying others' lives, you are participating with demons. If you use your freedom, because it's yours to use, to destroy your brother who is sensitive in his conscience, you are participating in the work of demons. And so that is what Paul is saying here. If you're going to use the freedom to participate and eat at the temples and partake and eat of the steaks, not really caring for your brother and thinking, oh, wow, look, there's Dave over there. He's having a good meal. You know, I understand he accepted Jesus Christ, but he's still coming over here and eating. So it must be okay to walk with Jesus and also worship these other demons. Yeah, I mean, this is the greatest world. I have God on the top shelf. Then I got all these small little demons, right? Other, other idols that, you know, in case God doesn't come through, they can come through. Or maybe God just takes care of the big things, right? And uh, all these other demons will take care of the small things. This is exactly what's participating. You go down to Angola, right? What do you see? That big, huge sign says, hey, poem reader, come on in here. Let me tell you about your spiritual life. Are you a Christian? Are you reading the horoscopes? No, horror. <laughs> they are horror. <laughs> are you looking for other things to give you direction or are you looking to God? Don't be divided and don't participate in the destruction of others because you are using your freedom for your own benefit and not simply to love and serve others. Okay, you do not drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Hey, Friday night, Saturday night, you go out to the bars or do whatever you want and then go to church on Sunday and say, that's all taken care of. It's under the blood. No problem. Doesn't work that way. Are you trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. I mean, I think of all the different times. I remember at times when, you know, we'd be out with my friends in high school and all of a sudden uh, we look and the, hear the door open to the pizza place or whatever. And guess who's coming in? It's going to be Jim's dad or it's going to be Bob's mom <laughs> because they went out when they weren't supposed to. And man, are they hot. <laughs> And there, you know, this is going to be sparks flying, you know, and, um, and there he is, there's son sitting there, his back is to the back is to the door. We're seeing what's coming on. We're going to go, Oh my, should we run? No, we don't want to run. We want to see this man alive. Take him by the scuff of his neck and drag him out. Not a pretty thing. When God comes after you, because you have not been where you should be, it's not going to be pretty. And you think the demons are going to sit back and say, oh, we're going to protect him. We're going to hold on to him. And they're going to sit back and watch and laugh as you get taken out by a jealous God. My parents, my friend's parents loved him and they drug him home. God's going to drag us home if he needs to, maybe early. But he is a jealous God who loves us. And there's a way of an escape. We can freely go or God can drag us out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's continue on as we read Paul's letter to the Corinthians. As we pick up here, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. Well, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Very plainly stated. You have the right, you have the right 
doesn't mean it's going to benefit you. It doesn't mean that it's going to be constructive. But you must seek the good of others because that will be beneficial to you and it will be constructive to you as it is beneficial to others and constructive to others. They are a carnal, a fleshly group of people who know Jesus Christ. And Paul is writing into the letter, get back on track. Verse 25, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of a conscience for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. There is no substance to this food being anything more than food. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal, great. And you want to go? Sit down, enjoy it. Eat whatever is put before you without raising a question about conscience. Why? Because there's nothing more to that food than food. Okay. But if someone says to you, hey, 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 Fred, that meat there has been offered to us as a sacrifice. Did you know that? I'm glad I stopped you before you ate, you ate that hamburger. Then what are you supposed to do? Oh, push away. Not because that meat's bad, because your brother's going to be offended. Or well, what about the guests? What about your friends? No. Hey, guys, I got to leave. Why? Because I just need to. It's my... My friend is going to be bothered by my going out with you. Well, what about us? I love my friend. I love you guys. You understand, but I can't cause him to stumble. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of, and for the sake of conscience. I am referring to the other person's conscience. In others, what he's saying here, your conscience, if you cause your brother to stumble, is important. Don't destroy your conscience when you call, if you cause your brother to stumble. Walk away from the freedom that sits before you that you can enjoy. For why is my freedom being judged by another conscience? Good question. Verse 29. 30 says, if I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? I gave prayer. I said, thank you, Lord, for the food. And now I got to walk away from it. <laughs> I love the conversation. I mean, people aren't even raising their hand. Hey, hey, Paul, what about this? No, Paul knows where they're going. He understands their mindset. Why? Because he's, he is like everybody else. But he's also dealt with this so he can, eat, he can answer these questions. So whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble. I don't care if they're Jew or they're Greeks or anyone in the church. Even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many. Why? so that they may be saved, saved. They may be saved from what? Salvation. They may be saved from the conscience. They may be saved from being pulled back into the world and live in a, world, a life of uh, misery. They are being saved. Only Jesus saves a man's soul. Paul's not talking about winning the salvation of others. He's talking about preserving the life of the believer, that they might be saved from the pain, the anguish, the destruction of their own life, the destruction of the life of their family. There was a lot at stake. And I'm not talking about the meat. I'm talking about the families, the church, the body of Christ, the reputation, our place in the world. There's a lot at stake how we live our lives and what we do with the freedom that Jesus bought for us. Okay, as we look into chapter 11, we start off with another example. For my example, as I have, as I follow the example of Christ. And so when we look at the life of Jesus Christ, we see the exact same thing. Now, hold it, you're gonna say, but Jesus, didn't Jesus drink wine? Absolutely. He's not talking about drinking wine. He's not talking about drinking beer. He's talking about a life that is lived. 
the words of Jesus were very consistent. I have come to do the will of the Father. And we see this over and over, that Jesus was come to do the will of the Father. And he lived his life, not for himself, but for others, so that we can see how much God the Father loved the world and how much he, Jesus the Son, loved his father. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for upholding the traditions just as I pass them on to you. And now we're moving and we're talking here. It is the same idea. He's talking about, again, you know, not theology as much as the practical aspect of how we are to live our lives. Now he's talking about head covering. And are women, what's women's role in the church? What's her role in life? What's a man's role in the family? What is he supposed to do? Let's not take this out of context. Let's understand it within the context of a, of a people who have not broken away from their earthly ways, their worldly habits, and they brought them into the church. And now he's saying, listen, guys, you're making a mess of this because you're living for yourselves and not living for God. And it has to do with this tradition as well. I praise you for remembering me and everything in upholding the, the traditions, not the law, the traditions, just as I pass them on to you. Why do we have traditions? Traditions remind us of things. We have traditions in the school system, right? We have colors, we have mascots, we have ceremonies, all right? They're all to remind us of something that is important, okay? Unity, bringing us together. And so these traditions, they're not law. Can you change traditions? Sure, if you don't like your life. <laughs> sure enough, as, to, as soon as you try to change a tradition anywhere, you're going to have those who rise up. You never hear from them. You change your traditions. You're messing around with them. It's not the law. They're traditions, but they're there for a purpose, and they serve a purpose. They can be changed. They're not what we worship, but Paul says, I'm thankful to you that you've kept these traditions, and let's talk about what these traditions are and what they represent, because is to help keep them in line. All right. I praise you for remembering me and everything and for upholding the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ. It's not the wife, okay? In other words, this is what Paul is going to get to. The head of every man is God, okay? It's not the wife. Your wife has a to-do list? I tell you what, God has a to-do list, all right? And just say, hey, God, I can't take care of you. I got to take care of the missus, all right? Nah, it doesn't work that way. You're the man of the home. You have to take care of the to-do list that God gave you, all right? And so that's what Paul is saying. It's not the wife, okay? You, you have used as an as excuse not to be the spiritual leader that you were called to be. So the head of every man, as we read here, okay, is Christ. And the head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors God. So this was the tradition. We don't have this tradition today. It's not been passed on. We don't need to follow this tradition today. All right. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors God because he's violating the tradition that reminds him that Christ is the head. Christ is the head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Why? Because she is saying, I'm an authority. I'm the one in authority. And that's what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about our traditions today. He's not talking about so many things we want to put this on. He's saying, listen, man, who is authority? Not your wife. God is. Woman, who's an authority? Not you, but God is. And I put the man to be rise up and to do his job. So don't take it over. 
But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. And so now he's saying, listen, let's just look into nature and you're going to see the same thing. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. Whoa, no, 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 don't go there. You know, a woman's hair, you know, is long or, or short. What is her hair? Is her glory. And don't you mess with it. <laughs> Matter of fact, don't tell her she can't go to Toledo and get her hair cut there when there's somebody just right down the road is shorter and, and less expensive. Don't you dare say that because a woman's hair is her glory, is her charge. All right. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off, yep. Well, or to have her head shaved, then she should cover her head. And Paul's just making a very simple argument. And they're all going, yep, the man's right. He's got it. I understand completely now. Thank you, Paul. You put it in terms we can understand. <laughs> all right. Hey, time goes on. Read this. And it gets pretty profound as we then move into the Lord's Supper, because this theme continues you know, sometimes we want to take these out of context, but this is all the context of the letter. The corruption of the communion had to do with the selfishness in which they were living their lives and the idolatry, because that's what it is. When you worship yourself, that's idolatry. And that's the one commandment we're told over and have no false gods, no other gods. Do not create idols because it will lead you astray, away from God and away from loving your neighbor. All right, read that within the context. I leave it with you. Let's close with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Open your word to us so that our hearts might be changed. Help us to understand all the goodness and the grace of the promised land that you wanna bring us into. Just as the children of Israel and old were not able to enter into the joy and the, and the fruit of the land because of unbelief, unwillingness to, to trust. So we can find ourselves miserable Christians, unwilling to go into the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, because we're unwilling to let go and to trust in you and to love you. Be with our leaders, Father, as they continue to Chart the course, Pastor Jim, myself, Linda, for the council as we'll be meeting for the Binette, laying plans for the summer, for the worship team, Lord, as we gather together on Sunday, may they be instrumental in bringing our hearts together before your throne and the fellowship that before and the fellowship that follows. May it be sweet and encouraging to you. May it be as it was meant to be, not divisive, but communal. And Heavenly Father, help us to disciple one another, to give way to each other, because we see the brother who is weak, and we want to bring him along and not leave him on the side of the road. Help us, Father, to reach out to those who have gone astray, to bring them back in, and to those who may not have heard the good news, but yet are searching, may we give them the good news. All of this, Father, we give you thanks, and we give you praise, as we commit ourselves to you in the power of the Holy Spirit, we submit ourselves. Amen. Well, God bless you, friends. Thank you for joining this morning. Greg and Nikki, Sherry, Sharon, and Fran, I'm great to be back with you. It's nice to be live. So we will see you soon. And Greg and Nikki, we'll see you at small group today. God bless.